want to go ahead and continue uh, where we left off last week in our lesson uh, seven in our series, Deliverance Today. And we've been talking about um, holding on to what you've got. And it's important to, to hold on to what you've got because the enemy would love nothing more than to take what we've been given in the form of our deliverance and throw it by the wayside. And if you remember, we talked last week about ultimately the enemy's aim and the enemy's goal is to get us to basically curse ourselves. Now, I could ask the question, I already know the answer, so I'm going to ask it rhetorically. How many of us would just willfully walk around basically crossing out everything that God has blessed us with? None of us, right? No, no, none of us would tell God, God, I appreciate the blessing, but you know what? I don't want it. That's okay. I, I appreciate you making a way for me, but you know what? That's all right. I'm good. I, I, I appreciate you healing me and, and bringing me out, but you know what? I kind of like this pressure. I'm going to hold on to it. None of us in our right mind would do that. But what we've got to understand is that the enemy's job is to get us out of our right frame of mind. The enemy would love nothing more than to, to get us so caught up in emotion, to, to get us so caught up in the natural things around us that it would keep us from maintaining our relationship. Because so often what happens is that we'll go through deliverance and we'll uh, take the emotional high of being set free. And it is an emotional time and it's a time to be joyous. But we'll let it fleet just like we let that emotion fleet, because no matter how much we love the Lord and no matter how much we praise God, after we're done shouting, after we're done jumping up and down and running around the sanctuary, there's a world out there that would love nothing more than to cross out everything that God has just given us. And what we've got to do is we've got to remember that we've got to do work to hold on to what we have. Amen. Amen. Uh, we tell people all the time, my wife and I tell people all the time, what it took to get them when it comes to a relationship, what it took to get them, it takes that and then some to keep her. And the enemy would love nothing more than to come along and short circuit saying, well, you, you said yes to Jesus. That's enough. No, no, no. That's just the beginning. And we think that that's just the end, but it's just the beginning. And we talked a little bit about um, house shopping last week. Week and we did it against the scripture. We talked about the, the, the parable that Jesus told about uh, the house being emptied after the demons are gone. They're wandering to and fro, as I paraphrase, looking for some place to reside. And they get the bright idea, hey, you know what? Let me check the Craigslist and see if where we got kicked out of is still available. And often what happens is when we don't take the time to truly hold on to what we've got by exercising the things that we're going to continue to talk about tonight, it leaves us empty. It leaves us vulnerable. It leaves us set up for ourselves to be put, if we're not careful, in a worse state than what we're in when we started. Like I said before, I say again, none of us, if we're working and functioning in our right mind, would willfully ask or willfully go back to what we came from. Amen. And what God desires us to do is he desires us to understand that while the steps toward to deliverance are a blessing, we need to know them. This is where our living is, A.D. And I use B.C. and A.D. all the time when I talk about my own journey, my own walk. When I'm talking about B.C., that's before Christ, because everybody has a B.C., right? We all have a B.C. But when I talk about A.D., that's after deliverance. Amen. And, and, and see, what God desires us to do is walk in the fullness of our life, in the fullness of the power that God has given us in our A.D. season. But what the enemy would love to do, he'd love to drag us right back to B.C. Because if you think about how the calendar works and how the calendar operates, the calendar operates and works in B.C. in reverse. So if a new year comes in, like when next year comes in, instead of it being another year out, 2025, if it were BC, it would be instead of 2024, 2023. And the enemy would love nothing more to get us back into that BC mindset because before Christ, what we were doing was wasting time. We were wasting time, and every day that went by was one less day we had to get it right, one less day to turn our lives around, one less day to make it right with God, one less day to ask God to save us and heal us and deliver us, and each day that he can keep us in that BC mindset, he's keeping us away from our keys. 
He's keeping us away from what it is that we need to be all that God has called us to be and walk in the fullness of our victory. So quickly, I want to just review the, the four things that we looked at um, as far as the keys to retaining our deliverance. And I want everybody to remember, remember John 8, 36, what does it say? So if the son makes you free, then you're what? Unquestionably free, right? Whom the son sets free, the King James Version says is what? Free indeed, amen. That means that we are unquestionably free. That means that no matter what the enemy tries to say, we are free. We've got an ironclad guarantee of being free indeed, provided we continue to walk in the liberty that the Lord has given us. Pastor, how do you do that? You do that by using the keys to maintain your deliverance. Amen. Now, what I desire, I, and, and I, I, I'm, I really want us to, to dialogue. I don't want it to necessarily be a one-way conversation. So this, this, this week in the sanctuary, I'm trying something new. So if you guys have something to say, in open form, please come on up. The microphone over there on the floor is on. So you can just go stand behind it. If you got a question, if you got a comment, please feel free. It is okay. It's okay. Come on up. It's, it's fine. Come on up. Microphone is on. And I do that because I want everybody to be able to hear what's being said because we all have input that's valuable. Go ahead, brother. Uh, Pastor Thomas, yes, I, would sir. Like, I would like to know, I've asked all of you, mm -hmm. that's true. When Jesus died, the death, burial, and resurrection, did he remove the curse Adam originally gave us? That's an excellent question. Before I answer it, let's throw that question out there to everybody else. Did everybody on, in, on Zoom hear the question? Yeah. Did you all hear the yeah. question on Zoom? Huh? Yeah. Yes, okay. I, did, I did. I didn't hear it. Can you re can you repeat it, Pastor? I didn't hear. Come on back up, brother, please. Uh, they uh, we got people on Zoom as well listening in. Would you mind repeating the question one more time, please? When Jesus had the death, burial, and resurrection, did he remove the curse Adam originally cursed us with? Amen. Amen. The question was when Jesus. Uh, went through the process of death, burial, and resurrection. Did he remove the curse that Adam initially cursed us with? That's the question. Anybody? Anybody have any thoughts on that? That's a great question. Yes, sir. Come on up. Well, I was always taught that he did, but then this brother got me thinking about what he cursed the woman with, which is painful childbirth, and I wanted to touch on that, and I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Excellent question. Excellent comment. Uh, did you all hear what the brother said? Sort of. Yes, I heard him. Okay. Go, go ahead, brother. So, so, from my understanding... Uh, you can speak up. It's fine. So, from my understanding, he, re he redeemed us. Yes, I think, yes. But I, I could be wrong, but I believe with all my heart, yes, because he reconciled us with God. Because uh, the uh uh sin, the 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 sin, it took blood. That's why it was always the animals mm -hmm. and everything. So for all of us, it took like uh his godly blood, like the living, living water, the living blood. This is what I believe. It took that to like you said, it set us free. Yes, sir. Uh, he 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 was on that cross. For, he bore everything that we did and everything that we was gonna do. That's why it was such a horrible way that he died. But I I, I don't believe that he died. I believe he said he he gave it up because he could pick his life back up. Right. For his, for his friends or his family. Amen. Amen, Amen. brother. Will. Amen. Thank you for that. Th thank you for that. Excellent comment. Excellent comment. Anybody on on Zoom have a comment they'd like to share? Okay. My thoughts um, to answer, absolutely, to answer the initial question, yes, Jesus dying on the cross did free us from the curse. It did. The thing that makes it a challenge, and it doesn't make it a challenge of what was done, the thing that makes it a challenge for us, which is why it's critical for us to understand the keys, is what we picked up, and I say picked up, Loosely, because it came about as a result of sin. And that is the capacity to choose. Okay? Because we have the capacity to choose, Jesus has done the redemptive work. Because we, we talked about it a little bit, actually, in worship service Saturday in the sermon. And, and, and the whole...
premise that it, it came about in in remembering who you are, because that's what the subject was. Remember who you are is that we're redeemed from the curse by the blood. And that's the key. We're redeemed from the curse by the blood. If we had to take the whole premise of salvation and the working uh, premise of it, that's the working premise of it. We're redeemed from the curse by the blood. There's nothing we can do to earn it. There's nothing we can do to work out of it. We can't negotiate our way out of it. It's not let's make a deal. There's only one way out. And that's we're redeemed from the curse by the blood. The key is we have to make the choice to accept the redemption. We have to make the choice. We have to. And to your point, brother, about, about childbirth and all those things, I, those are ab absolutely things that are that were put into place. And I guess the easiest way for me to explain it, and I would ask for input from you know Sanctuary and, and Zoom, the easiest way for me to explain it is this. If you're a parent and you have a child that disobeyed, that did something that they weren't supposed to do, okay? Mm -hmm. Because of what they did, and not only the magnitude of it in that moment, but because of the potential harm that could happen in the future if they were allowed to do it again, part of the punishment might be, well, guess what? You just lost your privilege to do this. And as a result of that, this is what's going to happen going forward because you are a danger to yourself. It might mean you may not have access to the car after 9 p.m. It might mean you may not have access to your cell phone or these certain apps. It might mean you can't hang around that person. You can't go to that place anymore. It's put in place and it's designed to stay in place long after the offense has been forgotten about, long after you've repented of the offense and you're back in good standing with your parents. Because as parents, we never just start hating our children and throw our children away because they mess up. The whole reason why we get angry is because we love our children and we don't want anything bad to happen to them. And sometimes in the process of that, we got to be reminded. They got to be reminded. You know what? You kind of brought this on yourself and there might be a little bit of hardship you got to have. There's a blessing in it. But you got to remember, use this hardship as a point to remember. Use it as the, the proverbial thorn in your flesh. You know, understanding that God's grace is sufficient. Not your capacity to talk out of it. Not your capacity to, to finagle out of it or, or deal out of it. Sometimes it's there as a reminder. And again, I, I don't, by no means do I make light of childbirth. By no means do I make light of the whole premise of having to go out and, and work and, 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 and scrape in the dust to, to make a living because that was part of the uh, pronouncement on the man during that same stretch when that was pronounced concerning childbirth. And even if we look at that pronunciation concerning childbirth, it, it, it led into one of my favorite passages, passages of scripture. And I say it all the time, there wouldn't be a John 16 were there not a Genesis 3.15 which basically said concerning the serpent that ultimately, as I paraphrase, yet yeah, a serpent, you're going you're gonna to bruise the heel, but ultimately the heel is going to crush the head of the serpent. And that goes to say that, yes, challenges are a part of our new way of life, but ultimately victory is ours, provided we make the choice. Now, the fact, brother, that you brought up the whole premise of the question about did that, did, did Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection okay. remove the curse of Adam? That's, in essence, what these keys are about. When we looked at it a little bit in services past Saturday, and we're going to look at it briefly tonight because we only have three more keys and it actually leads into them. At every point, and, and, and Pastor, feel free to join in and, and help me at any point. At every point of our existence, that working equation we're redeemed from the curse by the blood is in effect. And if you really sit down and unpack that, you'll see that God's grace is not only sufficient and God's redemption is not only great, but it's complete. I'm talking complete. And when I say complete, I'm talking like, 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 like point for point, point counterpoint. Let me explain. It says in the word that he was wounded for our transgressions, right? Okay. A transgression defined but a particular type, an outward sin, a sin of action that carries an effect 
in your life and or the life of other people. Which means every time we go out and sin, every time we go out and, 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 and curse somebody out, every time we go out and lie on somebody, every time we go out and do any of those things that made the, the top 10, that's a transgression. Which means that we're now under the curse. But the word says in the working definition that we're redeemed from the curse by the blood, which brings us to a wound. One of the wounds, unfortunately, we hear about all the time today is a GSW, a gunshot wound. But when a person is wounded, that means that a trauma has happened to the body. And I need everybody to really catch this. A trauma has happened to the body that's caused an injury that's forced blood to be shed on the outside of the body. So when Jesus was wounded for our transgressions, the blood was released from his body to come on the outside and void the sin that took place on the outside because we're redeemed from the curse of outward sin by the wounds for transgression that Jesus got. With me so far? He was bruised for our iniquity. A bruise defined is a wound that takes place, trauma that happens that breaks blood vessels under the skin that forces blood to shed underneath your skin, and it usually pools, it turns blue, it turns purple, it turns black, eventually it'll heal. But when that happens, that means that there's a wound uh, uh, on, on the inside. There's a bruise on the inside. So iniquity is sin that takes place on the inside. Jealousy, envy, lust, Things like that. And that's why I said, when we really look at this thing, it's complete deliverance. So not only did he suffer a traumatic injury on the outside of his body to avoid the curse by the shedding of blood for the transgressions, but he also shed blood on the inside of his body because he was bruised for our iniquities. Because all the trauma that, that, that beat on him from people punching him and saying, okay, prophesy, who was it that hit you? That caused trauma. Just like when we allow jealousy to come in, we allow envy to come in, we allow fear to come in, we allow worry to come in. And people talk about, well, well worry is not that big. No, no, worry is a sin because there's no such thing as big sin, little sin. It's all sin. And what those things can do, if over time they're allowed to continue, they can begin to beat on your spirit and pound on your spirit and rain blows on your spirit like Jesus suffered and begin to bruise your spirit so much to the point that, again, the enemy will use demons of discouragement and, and, and demons of, of hopelessness to come in because the ultimate goal and end game of the enemy is to pull us out of our after deliverance living by getting us to curse what God has blessed, which is us. So when we begin to speak things that are negative, it pulls us out of that deliverance living and puts us back in the BC mindset, which means we've got to start functioning in a way to self-care in a negative way. And self-care in a negative way brings about sayings like hurting people hurt people. Because they use it as a defense mechanism. They figure in their mind, they're thinking, well, I'll never get better. So if everybody around me, if I can get them down to my level by making their life worse, then I'll be on a level playing field. And that's when the enemy's like, I got you. And now what I'm doing is not only do I have you, but now I got my hooks in somebody else. Because if you've been, if you've been with us since lesson one, we talked about the wiles of the enemy. And wiles is from the Greek word methodia, which is where we get the word method from. That's part of the enemy's method of his madness. His method is if I could just get a hook in you, just a little bit, then I got a chance. But to your point, brother, which is why the deliverance happened, I could walk all the way through about all the different places the chastisement of our peace was upon. I could walk through all of that. But time won't let me. But I'll suffice it to say this. It all comes down to the very thing that the enemy tried to use to break us. God is still using that same capacity we have to make us. It's a choice. We've got to make the choice. And once we make the choice 
to make our declaration of spiritual independence. That's when we say, whom the son sets free is free indeed. And guess what? I I'm under the blood of the son. So I'm free indeed. So now I got to use the keys that have been given to me because you remember, please come on up, Pastor, please. Because yeah, remember, when, when the revelation came to Simon, when his name was changed to Peter, he said, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you of who I truly am. But once he gained the revelation of who Christ truly was, yes, Lord. not only did he change his name, but the promise. Like we did this when we started talking about it. Promises, you know what? Upon this rock, I'll build my church. So now I'm going to give you the keys you. to the kingdom. Which means whatsoever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatsoever, whatsoever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Those terms binding and loosing are significant because that's what you do when you're engaged in deliverance. Yes. So, Pastor, what well, you mean is all the cities, the beatings, and the curses? Was to remove all of our iniquities? Yes, sir. 100% correct. Absolutely, because we're redeemed from the curse by the blood. And that's why these keys are critical. Yes, Pastor, please go right ahead. First and foremost, I would like to thank our Heavenly Father, thank Jesus, and the Holy Spirit for giving us this opportunity to be able to be in our Father's house and to be able to do our Father's will, which is for us to learn how to fight our enemies. There's a spiritual war that's going on among us every day. The same thing that Pastor's talking about as far as they want to claim souls. It's not no joke. And we have a blueprint where in the word it tells us in Ephesians that we must keep our armor on. See, we have to have that breastplate on our helmet, our belt, keep our sword, keep our shoes right. There's a lot of different aspects that we can be these fiery darts that's coming at us from these evil spirits. They want to use us by making a, uh, it's, it, it, how can I put it? It's almost like a gateway mm -hmm. or a, um, it, 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 if you open up a portal, yes, you have to give them a key. See, when they knock and do this here, you say, no, 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 Satan, I'm busy serving the Lord. You're not allowed to come in my house right now. And I'm not going to allow you in. You have to find somebody else. Because I'm protected under the blood of Jesus. But if we resort to being of the world instead of being in the world by indulging in alcohol, drugs, or anything that's contrary to our Father's laws and covenants, then these spirits are saying that you didn't gave them a welcoming, open arm reception mm -hmm. to come in and destroy our life and capture our spirits and destroy our souls. Amen? So what we need to do, like Paul instructed us, is to stay in constant prayer every day. That's why we pray every day. And you have to stay in supplication. That means you stay in your word. Wherever the Holy Spirit moves any of us to go to, mm -hmm. just open up your word. You don't have to read the entire chapter or book. All you have to do is just read a verse or two and, and just to get that in your spiritual feeding for that day. Yes. Amen, Pastor. Yes. Amen, Pastor. So, you know, I could go on and on and on and on because I love serving the Lord because I know it doesn't take much. Just like you say, if you get that hook in, you know, that one drink, mm -hmm. that one smoke, Anything that you do, that's telling these demons, come on in and I'm going to serve you. Because you can't serve two gods. Because you're going to what? Love one and hate the other. You're going to love one and hate the other. Amen? Amen. Well, I just want to say that I love everyone in here. And we all know what the commission is by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Said. We have to spread the gospel and make disciples. Everyone in here to me is considered a disciple of Christ. Everyone on Zoom right now is considered a disciple of Christ. You have to keep that mindset. Every day when you wake up, wake up willing to do the will of our Heavenly Father and the devil and Satan cannot get us and we can tell him get behind us. And if you think about it, when Jesus was with his disciples, he never had any temptation by Satan. As soon as he went into the wilderness, this is when the devil 
felt that he was his weakness when he actually was his strongest. Amen? It's something to think about. Mm -hmm. That's why when any of us leave each other, we are strong as a brotherhood. Amen? Because when we get alone, it's almost like a sheep that's put to the side, and now all these wolves is coming at this sheep. That sheep has no way of surviving. But if it's a crowd of sheep, then it's a chance to survive because we are protected by the Lord. Amen? Amen. Well, I love all you all in the blood of Jesus, and I continue to just want to see everybody survive and fight these enemies. Don't leave. Anybody that you're around is not of the Lord, leave them alone because they're going to bring you down because they serve the devil and we serve the Lord. And it's so serious because it's a spiritual warfare that's going on around us right now. The Lord is near. It's going to be a destruction just like Noah's time and Sodom and Gomorrah. It's no different. These people are evil out here. Just like he said, the road to destruction is what? The path to righteousness is narrow. So it's not going to be a lot of us. If it's seven, eight, ten billion people on this earth, eight, nine of them are going to be destroyed because they're evil and all they want to do is serve the death. Amen? Amen. Well, I love y'all in the blood of Jesus. Amen. 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 God bless you, Pastor. God bless you. And, and you basically teed it right up to where we need to go. Amen. Right up to where we need to go. We talked about this a little bit last week concerning the keys. And these remaining keys, while all of them are keys that are ongoing, these remaining keys we're going to talk about tonight are the master keys, if you will. I mean, a master key you can use it anywhere. Crucifying the flesh, which I appreciate. I so appreciate your question. I so appreciate your comment. I do, because it, they both tie, and your comment, Brother Walt, they all tie right into what we have to do. We have to, brother, be in a constant state of crucifying our flesh, be in a constant state of being mindful, just as Pastor said, that the enemy is constantly fishing. He constantly seeking whom he can devour. He's in a constant state of seeing who he can get. Who can I get today? When I was in sales, I used to do sales much of my young adult life into my middle age years of my adult life. I did sales and I used to, I did pretty much everything. I sold suits, I sold uh, cable, I sold pretty much everything. And the thing that I found that was virtually the same, no matter what it was I was selling, was the prep period. You always had a prep period before you went out on the floor or you went out in the field and you went out or wherever you were going to do what you do. And that prep period was designed to get you uh, sharpened in your skills, sharpened in how to deal with rejections and how to do uh, how to overturn rejections with rebuttals. All that is is just knowing how to witness and understand the whole concept of apologetics. And the second part of it, which I found for myself most beneficial was it was a time to get yourself hyped up. And that's where, to your point, Pastor, your team had to be there to help you. You could come in with your supply. But if I brought my supply and Pastor brought his supply and brother, you brought yours and brother, you brought yours and first lady brought hers and, and my brother bring, brings his. When all of us bring our supply, but we all leave. We all going to be so pumped up and so revved up and so ready to face whatever comes our way. That even if we went out in the field, if I went out in the field and I was having a trying day, I remembered all the things that were said to me. Don't, don't, don't skip a door. Don't pass by a person. Every single person has a potential. Every person has an opportunity because the mindset is set in that time of preparation. And our mindset has to be continually set on the fact that we're going to walk in victory and walking in victory means we're going to rebuke the devil. And as we do the work of making disciples, our mindset is, who can I bless with the gospel today? Who can I bless with the gift of Jesus today? But what the enemy is doing, which is why it says here, he's constantly seeking who he can devour. And he can use and he'll use what we've been delivered from as bait to draw out our flesh. What he wants to do is get us to the point of he's saying, who can I hook and pull back today? Who can I catch and, 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 and pull out of their deliverance and pull them back to that BC mindset? Who can I get with doubt? Who can I get with fear? 
Who can I get with double-mindedness? All of these things that are directly related to carnal thinking, which is flesh-driven, because it all has an expiration date. But see, God's grace is sufficient. His faith is more than enough. And I love the word when it says he doesn't only give us a measure of faith. The word, if you read it closely, says he gives to every man the measure of faith, which means he gave you exactly what you need to do exactly what I've called you to do. The only thing that's stopping you from doing it at the end of the day is you. Are you going to choose to do it? Or are you going to choose to go another route? And the other route sometimes looks so attractive. It looks so appealing. It looks so easy to, to pass this point. It looks so smooth. The whole road is wide open. So I'm from I'm from the Illinois, I'm from the Chicago land area, so I suffer from a bad case of this disease called the Chicago 15. I really do. And you know what I'm talking about. Whatever speed limit is, you add 15 miles an hour to it, and that's your normal running speed. See, and part of the reason for me why that's the case is because, you know, all of main highways down there and around the city, because I did a lot of work in and around the city, they're all three lanes, they're all four lanes, they're all five lanes, they're all paved, or in the process of getting repaid, they're nice and smooth, so you got a nice smooth ride, and oh, you know what you're doing 100, don't we feel it? We do. Milwaukee's catching up, but we do. But here's the thing. We do have the best, brother, but unfortunately for me, many, many times, we also got some of the best state troopers that can catch you and can track you down. <laughs> and, um, while you think you're rolling and making up time for me, while I'm making up time, I get pulled over. Now, all that time I made up, I'm losing it and then some because I'm sitting there waiting for them to run my license and let me know this, that, and the third. But here's the thing. There's a way that seems right unto a man. It's a super highway. I'm getting it in. I'm doing what I want to do. I'm doing me. But in the end, it leads to destruction. And the thing about that versus getting pulled over on the expressway here in Milwaukee or down in Chicago, when we get pulled over by the enemy, it's too late. Ain't no getting back in the car and driving off. Because it's appointed to every individual who wants to die. And after death comes the judgment. We're only going to get pulled over once to truly get checked out. And once we get checked out, there is no getting back in and taking off. This is why we got to get it right now. And crucifying our flesh is critical because we've got to break those old patterns. We got to break those old habits. We got to break them. And the breaking is not designed to leave us crippled. It's not designed to leave us maimed. Very much the opposite. It's designed to leave us better. Because as we daily deny our flesh, what we got to do is that energy that we're using, that we used at one point in time to deny we take that negative energy and turn it to something positive. And that denial energy is now being turned to setting our will towards doing God's will in our lives. In, in plain English, that energy that we use to say no, now we're taking that energy that we use to say no to God and we're throwing all that energy into our yes to God. And as we say yes to God, this flesh begins to die. You know you want that drink? Yeah, my flesh does, but you know what? My spirit doesn't. Because it is written, because that's our superpower. I hear all, all the time in groups, in focus groups, and this and that. You know, hello, my name is such and such, and my superpower isn't great with people. Hello, my name is such and such. My superpower is this, is that. I'm of the opinion of, 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 of my name is Derek, and my superpower, well, you get that my, name is, my name is Derek, and my superpower is, stand my hand up. My, my superpower is I serve a risen Savior and my will is set in doing his will every day. And I'm not going to let anything separate me from the love of God. And for me, that's part of my declaration. When I look at that, that's part of my preamble. Going back to the word, I'm not going to let height, I'm not going to let depth, I'm not going to let this, I'm not going to let that, I'm not going to let my own mortality separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, because whom the Son sets free, which is me, I'm free indeed. So I'm going to crucify this flesh daily. It's ongoing. It's a master key. I'm at work and having a challenging day at work and everything in my flesh wants to rise up and tell somebody where to go and how to get there. I'm going to crucify my flesh. And remember, the word says, bless those that curse you. Pray for those that spitefully use you because as you do that, you're placing hot coals on their head. 
The way I explain it to people is this. I'm stepping out of the way and I'm letting God do it. See, so often we want to go to the forefront. But part of being a good soldier is knowing how to take orders. And sometimes the commanding officer will tell the soldiers to fall back. And he's telling you to fall back, not because you're scared, but he's telling you to fall back because he wants to preserve you. To your point, Pastor. So that the minimum amount, if any, has to be lost because of the greater victory that has to be won. And sometimes crucifying our flesh means that we've got to fall back. And that's why deliverance is so important because sometimes once we deliver, we think we're big and bad and bold enough to do whatever we want to do. I got the devil. I got, I got, I got my whole armor on. Yes, you do. But son, right now as your CEO, Holy Spirit says, I need you to fall back. I need you to fall back like the old song said. I need you to step back and let God do this. Because if you don't, what might happen is you might get consumed and get sucked right back into that BC mindset. Why are you doing it? Doing it because I, I can beat Mike Tyson. No, I can't. But if you could have beat him, you never would have had to go through the process. Mm -hmm. Got to check the motives to make sure that even the motives are not flesh driven. That they're not carnal. Because retaining our deliverance means that we got to take up our cross daily. And follow Jesus at all costs. This ain't about when it's when it's easy. This ain't about when we got plenty and plenty in the spiritual tank. This ain't about when I'm happy. This ain't about none of that. I say many times when I'm in the midst of doing praise and worship places, there, there are two times that God has said that we're to worship him when we feel like it and when we don't. We all good at doing it when we feel like it. But it's those times that we don't that we struggle with. And this master key right here, of developing a life of continuous praise and prayer, continuous praise and prayer. The first time I tuned into a 24-hour gospel channel anywhere, it, it changed my whole perspective, what worship could be. It changed my whole perspective of what worship was supposed to be because it helped me truly see in real time. This really is a 24-hour proposition. I could turn my TV on at 3 o'clock in the morning if I'm crying or stressed out about something and there's a word for me. I could turn my TV on at 6 o'clock in the morning while I'm getting ready to go to work and there's a word for me. I could turn the TV on or the radio on at 12 noon at my place of employment and there's a word for me. There's power in the ongoing presence of the word in your life. And what God desires, he wants that to begin to come from us. He wants it to emanate from us. He wants us to be an amplifier of it. If you think about radio, and I think about it a lot because I live up here in Wisconsin, no disrespect to, you know, y'all in this time, it's football season, I love my bears. And, but I found it to be a challenge to get in touch with my bears because I'm here. And FM radio only goes so far because FM radio stands for frequency mode. And what happens is as you cross from area to area, region to region, in my case, from state to state, you find that even if your dial is set on the same frequency, and I want you to catch this, when you move from one state to another state, Unless the wattage and the frequency is strong enough, eventually the content of that station is going to change. And the only way that you can guarantee that you keep listening to the same thing, and I know because I've done it with Caleb, you have to change the frequency when you get to a different state. But the reason why I like AM so much is that AM is short for amplifi amplification mode. Which means that the whole concept of the AM signal without going deep into it is simply it takes whatever's happening at the source and it continues to amplify bigger and bigger and bigger so that the bigger is amplified, the further the signal tra travels. Which means while I can't catch the bears on the FM frequency. If I tune into the AM frequency, if I tune into News Radio 780, if I tune into to WGN 720, or if I tune into the score at 670, all the way down in Chicago, I can hear exactly what's happening in real time. 
God desires us to function spiritually in amplification mode. He wants us to continue to build our worship bigger and bigger so that we can help people see that God is bigger than your circumstance. He's bigger than your challenge. He's bigger than your problem. He's bigger than your addiction. Because as we amplify him, we can then begin to establish for somebody the reality like I found when that, when that station came online. That I serve a God that's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's never a bad time to call on him. There's never a time that I'll call heaven and the line is busy. There's never a time that I'll call and I'll not get an answer. Who wouldn't want to serve a God like that and tell everybody about that? And when we do that, the byproduct of developing that continuous praise and prayer time with God is that we begin to live what 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18 says, that in every situation, no matter what the circumstances, be thankful and continually give thanks to God, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. The King James Version puts it this way, in everything, give thanks. That means good times and bad times. That means while you're smiling and your tears are tears of joy, or while you're crying and your tears are tears of pain. We have to meet, we have to take the, the Job mindset every now and then. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You don't think that was challenging for that man? He had lost everything, including his children. Yet he found the capacity to praise God. How? Because he understood that he was still a living part of the declaration that we have for us that whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And while he didn't live in the time of the sun, he had tapped into the principle that my salvation is found in something greater than me. Again, like I said a couple of weeks ago, lesson one in the 12-step program is what? Admission is the first step of recovery. Lesson two is what? Understand that there's a power greater than you at work. Those are the master keys. And as we learn how to use the master keys, God can better use us to make a difference in the lives of others, but he can't use us to our maximum capacity if we're not walking in the fullness of our deliverance. That's why the enemy is trying to shut us up. You've never, ever, ever in your life seen the enemy go after somebody that he's already got. You know why? Because that's wasted time. That's wasted energy. That's wasted resources. That's warfare 101. You don't expend time and energy winning space and ground that you already have. Because what's used in that scenario, what's used is consumed. It's not like the dunamis that we have because dunamis is God's given power. Dunamis is, is, is God's capacity of power. That's where we get the word dynamite from. It's not like the spiritual dynamite that we have where we can stand here in Milwaukee today and preach Jesus Christ and crucified and a thousand souls come, then fly as Holy Spirit will lead down to Chicago and do the same thing tomorrow and another thousand come, then as Holy Spirit will lead, fly down to Atlanta two days later and do the same thing and another thousand come. We can do that because that dynamite is being replenished. But if I try to take some sticks of dynamite and do that here, I can't grab them same sticks and take them with me because they're consumed. But the beautiful thing about our deliverance is that not only is the passage of scripture true for one time by the Lord's mercy we're not consumed, but it's perpetually true that by the Lord's mercy, we're not consumed because each and every day, each and every opportunity that he gives us as we walk with him in the freedom and the liberty of our deliverance, he replenishes, he restores, he equips us, he rearms us all over again to help people see that there's a better way. Praise is our expression unto God of thankfulness and adoration and joy. We can praise God all kinds of ways. Y'all notice when you walked in that you heard the warfare music playing. You notice when you walked in and wasn't a whole lot of talking going on. Didn't mean that we were in a bad mood. It meant that we were sitting in the atmosphere. We were making it conducive so that the Holy Spirit could have his way and speak in the moment. Because he's always speaking. He's that still, small voice. What he wants us to do is calm our spirit to the point that we can hear that still small voice, because that's the key 
to get in the guidance and direction we need to gain victory. My dad was in World War II. My dad was in the Navy. Now, I could go on about him, accolades for him. But the thing that blew my mind when I came to an understanding of it was something that he only talked about when he was dealing with the pain from the trauma of going to war at a relatively young age. My dad was in World War II. And he was at Pearl Harbor. He wasn't there December 7th. He's on one of the few boats that left on December 6th. So he wasn't physically there. But he used to tell a story all the time. And he used to always speak. And we thought it was gibberish. And we didn't understand it. I always do this. Talk about this person named Rhodes. And we didn't understand it. I didn't get it till I got to high school. When we started studying World War II and they started talking about soldiers that were battling in the theater in the, in the Pacific. And they were all taught on the ships how to speak just enough Japanese to be able to survive on the islands. And when I heard that, it's like Holy Spirit played what my dad was saying in my head. I'm like, that was Japanese he was speaking. And they said, it went on to say that, it, it, as we studied it, that, that they did that because even though the war was going on, and this is the point I want to get to, even though the war was going on, there were some sympathizers in the land. There were sympathizers in the land that understood that what was happening was not right and understood that they were on the wrong side, ultimately, of history. And there were individuals that were sent on assignment, not by Japan, but on assignment by a higher power to be there as points of light and contact with those individuals. And many of those individuals were female, and many of those individuals operated under the code name of Tokyo Rose. So when they said that, I'm like, okay. This man was a babbling. This man was trying to tell me his secret and formula of success as to why he's here. And what we've got to understand is that just like my father had a secret and formula of success that kept him almost 70 years after the war. God has given us a secret formula and a plan that's housed in prayer, that's housed in praise, that's housed in the continuity of doing both, that as we continue to praise and as we continue to pray, praise simultaneously does two things. It gets God in the building because God inhabits the praises of his people, and it makes the enemy null and void because praise stills the hand of the enemy. And both of those things are needed for us to maintain our deliverance. Because we need to do that when we feel like it and when we don't. When we feel like it, it's easy because that's skill. But God needs us to master when we don't because that's will. We've got to have the will to win. we got to have the will to maintain our deliverance, to keep our deliverance, to fight for our deliverance. God blessed us with our deliverance. I'm not going to let any demon in hell come and take it from me. I'm not going back to that madness. What? And God has put us in a position to walk in a way where we can, most importantly, maintain Man. a life of fellowship and spiritual ministry we talked about. None of us are islands in and of ourselves. None of us can do this by ourselves. None of us are created to have all the answers. I need your supply, just like you need mine. It doesn't make me any better than you. It doesn't make you any better than me. But together with one accord, it makes us better than the enemy. See, we spend so much time fighting with one another. In the church, we worship on Saturday. No, we worship on Sunday. We start at 10 a.m. No, we start at 11 a.m. Service goes one hour. No, service goes two hours. Well, you say the whole uh, whole doxology and service. No, you don't. Just say a summary. No, you don't say it at all. We're so busy majoring on the minor stuff that people are going to hell in a handbasket. And we're missing the whole point of what we were delivered to do. And unbeknownst to us, remember I said, all they got to do is just get a hook in you because he operates a method. He can get you caught up in religious error. 
Y'all can be so busy arguing with one another that you don't see this, you don't see them souls going over the cliff. Because you so desperately want to be right that we're missing out on what our calling is. And what the enemy wants to do, which is why I talked about it, I'm going to end right where I started. Enemy's looking for empty houses to occupy. Empty houses got to be right instead of desiring to be used. Empty houses got to win the argument. I got to win this battle instead of realizing that there's a war going on. And some battles you may not win because we have to remember we're not the key. God is the key. The word puts it this way. One plants, another waters. But God provides increase. And what deliverance does is it clears us of all the stuff that keeps us from being effective in planting and watering. Yes, it's 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 some the, the flesh thinks it's glamorous to be up front. The flesh thinks it's glamorous to have all the attention on you. I'm here to let you know this is heavy. It's heavy, Pastor. You know it's heavy. You don't you 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 to come up to teach, to come up to preach, to come up to minister. The, the preparation that we have to go through because the weight of God's word and the necessity to deliver it properly. Because you only get in some instances, you may only get one chance to do it, and if it's done improperly, that potentially is blood on your hands. This is serious business. And it's something that we can't go alone. This is why, brother, to your point, as we've been set free, we find individuals that are like-minded and like-hearted and like-spirited that understand that this is a privilege. It's not a right. It's a direct result of a decision and choice that we made to activate submission in our lives. Because as we submit to God's authority and will for our lives and allow him to fill us with his purpose, guess what? There's no room for the enemy because now the house is full. So when the spirits come around shopping for a house to go into and they come look at the window of yours, ain't no room for them in there because light and darkness can't dwell together in the same place. But sometimes we may not have all the furniture that we need to fill it up ourselves. We might need our brothers and our sisters to come along and help. You may have an extra dose of faith today that I might need to put in that corner over there. You might have just the right amount of encouragement to give me the light I need in my prayer closet. You might be the one to bring the correction that I need to fix what's going on, to give me the proper reception from heaven. This is why we got to work together. Does anybody have any questions or comments on the Zoom line as we prepare to close out? Okay. Yes, sir. Every day, mm -hmm. when I mm -hmm. as hard as I try to give me some peace, that's all I want. Mm. This world is so evil. I can do it by yourself and you prepare for a better Well, as, well as, we, as we close out of prayer tonight, the brother said that no matter how hard he tries, when he gets up in the morning, as much as he seeks and, 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 and looks for peace, it, it's, it's almost like he just can't find it. So tonight, as we close out in prayer, we're going to close out in prayer, remembering that we, we're, we've committed ourselves totally to this. We're all in. We're all in. There's no half-stepping in this. We're all in. And God is seeking us to be all in because retaining our deliverance understands that faith and trust in God is the greatest weapon against the devil's lies. Amen. While the word is our weapon of choice, the greatest weapon to keep us in the right headspace to properly use the weapon of choice is remembering that faith and trust in God is key because God never fails. It doesn't mean that we don't go through times where it seems as if we're not winning. But we do. But that's where, like going back to the last lesson, we have to ask ourselves, how bad do you want it? How bad do you want it? Are you willing to keep on fighting? Jacob wrestled all night long with a dislocated hip. I've never dislocated anything, but I've, I've torn a couple of ligaments in my knee, and I know that pain stopped me in my tracks. So I can only imagine what a dislocated bone feels like. And to keep on going, and to keep on going all night, that's the level of commitment that God is looking for. 
And with those master keys and the other keys we've discussed, that's how we hold on to what we've got. It's something that is ongoing and it's something that's critical for us to hold on to. Because as we hold on to it, what God can and will do is use us in a way so that he's glorified in the process. Living Witness Ministries is a church on the move dedicated to spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ through the preached and taught word, community activism and outreach, and practical ministry designed to meet needs, save souls, bless hearts, and transform lives. You can sow into Living Witness Ministries via Cash App at dollar sign LW Ministries 2020, Tithely or Givelify at Living Witness Ministries, LaGrange, Illinois, or Zell at Living to Witness at gmail.com. Sow your seed into the good ground of Living Witness Ministries today. And thank you for helping us reach the world with the life giving word. We pray you were blessed by today's message and would love to hear from you. If you have any prayer requests, praise reports, or would like to learn more about Living Witness Ministries, write to us at 606 West Wisconsin Avenue, Suite 202, PMB 1242, Milwaukee, Wisconsin 53203. Again, that's 606 West Wisconsin Avenue, Suite 202, PMB 1242, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53203. You can reach us by phone at area code 414-909-0133. That's area code 414-909-0133. You can email us at livingtowitness at gmail.com. That's the word living, the number two, witness at gmail.com. To follow Living Witness Ministries online, go to www.livingwitnessministries.org. Again, that's www.livingwitnessministries.org. Until next time, we want to encourage you to live your life as a living witness.